Hi, I'm Richard Moninsky, and this is For Art's Sake. My name is Carrie Ann Schumacher, and this is For Art's Sake. Hi, this is John Paul Smith, and you're watching For Art's Sake. Hi, I'm John Paul Smith. I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. I currently work with found materials, uh, weaving them together. Uh, it's kind of a process of collecting, gathering information, and sorting through it. Uh, a lot of times I'll take those found materials and cut them and weave them uh, back together. So this is kind of a, an earlier version of my work where I'm just optically mixing the work. I'm not really concerned about the final visual presentation. I'm more reacting to it as I make it. Uh, I have a large pile of sample strips and so as I'm weaving, I'll see I need a little more yellow here or blue, and that's, that's kind of how it evolved making this piece. Uh, this piece stands out a little different from the rest of my work, besides just being optically mixed as we look at a few other pieces, but uh, this is one of the few pieces I didn't hand cut. Usually the strips I, I actually cut with a utility blade and a long metal uh, ruler, like a tearing bar for printmaking. Um, but I actually went around to a lot of different Goodwills in Cincinnati trying to source out an old paper shredder that didn't cross cut. It gave you kind of like those, those movie versions where you see someone putting the papers in and there's long, yeah, uncut pieces coming out. So if you actually see this one up close, you can see all the little geared teeth of, of it being ran through the paper shredder. So that's kind of how this one originally came out. And the title, Seasonal Promotion, I, I always, well, through college, you always get hired on at Barnes & Noble as a seasonal employee, and that happened to me a lot. And so I just always like all the gearing up for something, uh, whether it be back to school or Christmas, or that's really where the title lends to from that piece. So This piece, uh, Holler, I, I'm, I'm more interested in keeping imagery combined. So if you kind of think of weaving as one sheet and two sheets that then you cut them and splice together, uh, at this point, I've actually made one sheet by keeping all the images combined. Like these are those uh, little paper throw pops for fireworks you have when you're a kid and you throw on the, uh, the ground and they explode. Edamame, silver packaging, Coca-Cola, black licorice. Uh, so one sheet is all those uncut together that makes up the different imagery. And then I slice those keeping together on one end so I can keep the uh, information organized. But then randomly it's just selections of uh, pieces I think are interesting for color or, or contrast to the actual background woven through it. So it has kind of a, you can kind of see a transition from the last piece where it was fully optically mixed. Here you can actually start to see imagery come out. Uh, and I really like that, that idea of public and private, you know, what we reveal to ourselves and what you can see in here. Kind of, again, like a magic 3DI, what's what you can see and sort out. Uh, and within my work, I really like to keep it open narrative so that people can actually connect to individual aspects within the piece with their own storyline. You know, when I look at a Rice Krispies box, I remember Saturday morning cartoons and kind of hanging out with my older brother. Uh, your version of what that brings up in your mind be, could be totally different from your own uh, cultural aesthetic or where you came from or your own regional behavior. Uh, so as we move, move down, this is kind of where I'm working right now. Um, and I'm, again, the one sheet, two sheet idea in, in weaving. These are two sheets of completely combined images. So you can kind of think of like it, think of it as a collage. So, um, for example, you see like a Crayola box here and the Trix rabbit. So if you saw that sheet uncut, it would look like all those collage together. So I make two sheets of that and then weave them together. Uh, and that's where you see all the combined, combined imagery um, of the piece. Um, the title of this one is actually Necessities, and uh, it's kind of a little straightforward, honestly. Uh, it was a terminology within my own family when mom would like go to the grocery store, you know, she would ask dad like what he wanted and kind of flip it because he didn't really want to think about it, which is, you know, uh, the necessity. So I've always, always uh, thought of that. And, and really it is, when you think of what people go to the grocery store, store for, very rarely are we bringing home like fresh produce and, and fresh meats and this kind of thing. It usually is processed things that really are like our glutton foods, our self-enjoyment foods. So. The Necessities is kind of a, a, a loose title, really, the, the idea of it being necessities. So. Sourcing the materials actually is, is really fun. Um, like when I've gotten a commission for, from a private collector, a lot of times they want an aspect of their life captured. Uh, so I kind of out of, you kind of take a whole family out of the waist string for six months and you get a really good idea of what actually goes on within the family. Um, 
you know, they, they may say that they eat all fresh fruits and, and they don't eat any processed food, but then I, I'll get a bag full of all their cardboard boxes and it'll be like Chips Ahoy. And so it's again, ties into the, the, the hidden aspect and what we reveal about our, ourselves. But uh, yeah, I, I rarely go out and buy a specific carton uh, if, it's, if it strikes me. It's, 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 it, it is mostly a diversion of waste is, is what I do, so. Um, and it's pretty interesting from the lowest quality product to like even like when you get a Tiffany ring from Tiffany and Company, you still have a box left over or a bag or so it, there is no differentiation of wealth kind of in the wealth, the waste stream. It's pretty interesting. Uh, so I'll, I'll get those, you know, he may have bought his a wife of some jewelry and in that same package will be like an empty Captain Crunch box. So uh, it's a pretty interesting dichotomy with, within the family itself. Within the work, you can see that I, I leave the edges kind of ragged. Um, visually, I do that for a reason. I, I think it kind of continues. Within your own mind, you can see the piece being larger and continue to grow. Um, also, my, my past work, and I still do make pieces of this size, are, were very large. They'd be six by nine feet, eight feet uh, an eight foot circle. Uh, I've made a piece as large as eight by 17 feet of woven material. and. Um, Doing that, it, and a lot of people can't actually have those within their homes when they go to collecting, so um, galleries you know, s suggested on how I could frame or if the work could be smaller and contained for protection. And, but I really thought that I would lose the tapestry aspect of my larger work that I enjoyed, that ability to people to walk up to it and enjoy it. Um, so that's kind of why in the frames I, I float it, I uh, hinge float it. So they're basically floating on two pieces. It's a rag mat on the back, and then the two pieces is acid-free foam core. Uh, and then a linen tape comes down onto the piece and goes through a slit in the mat, and they're taped on the back, and it gives that floating ability, which I really enjoyed. It goes back to my older work, and it, it allows for a lot of shadows within the frame. Uh, and I, I think that's just a really nice aspect of the work. My name is Carrie Ann Schumacher. I am an artist from the Chicagoland area and I am part of the exhibition Salvage. I make dresses out of romance novels, as you can see, as a way of both critiquing our culture, which builds myths around femininity and what it means to be female. And I also use them as a way to explore the stories of women in my own life. So this, for instance, is a dress based off of a picture of my grandma Genevieve that recently surfaced this past summer. And in the picture, my grandma just looked um, incredibly happy and incredibly beautiful. And it was sort of like she was going on a picnic and it was just blue skies and green grass and she had this cute little, you know, like curtsy pose and it was just so different, I guess, in a way from the way I remember her because she did end up um, dying from Alzheimer's. So it was just really this glimpse into a life I didn't know, and it was such a happy time. So I decided to make this really beautiful, frilly, romantic, sort of fanciful, carefree dress in remembrance of that picture and for her life before I knew her. Um, I get my romance novels from discarded books at libraries. I get them from thrift stores when they run like five for a dollar deals. I get them from people I've met online who um, write blogs about romance novels. And I also, I mean, sometimes I just have friends who say, hey, my mom has like 20 that she doesn't want anymore, do you want them? And I say, of course I want them. I will cut them up. So I'll take the pages of the books, like I'll rip them out of the books, and I make almost a panel, like I line up the pages in a row and I 
glue and duct tape them to make a strip and then I'll just start wrapping it around and I'll glue one panel to the other. So actually nothing is adhered to the base. It's all sitting on top. And then once you know it covers the form, I slit it either on the side or the back and I put Velcro in so it can be removed from the form if need be. And then if I wanna make a sleeve, I take toilet paper rolls and kind of configure them around my arm so it has a decent size that's somewhat lifelike and I attach with either glue or tape that to the base and then basically everything you see is glued onto that bottom form. So all the pieces I cut out independently and separately from each other and then it all just gets um, hot glued to the base. This dress for me actually summarizes um, and completes, I guess there's almost a trilogy for my other grandma, my grandma Alice, and I made one dress about her passing away. I made another dress about what I thought her life was like before she got married and had kids and became a grandmother. And then when I was making this one, it was about the time of, of year that I start thinking about my grandma Alice because it, it does get into late September um, when she passed away. And I see this almost as my goodbye to her, like my farewell to her. Um, and so I, I kind of like the title because I think in one way saying goodbye in the autumn of my 25th year could really be dealing with romance, it could be dealing with a breakup, um, it could be leaving somebody, but at the same time, for me, I, I know it, it isn't, it's actually as a commemorative piece for my grandma. Once I get the book and the understructure is assembled, um, I usually just take pages and I cut the parts that I need. So for instance, like these little leaves, are cut out individually by hand and hole punched and then they're glued in a way so that they're more three-dimensional and then I glue them onto the form. So this is all hole punching, like this is a big giant hole punch I have and I can just hole punch circles and then that gets glued onto the base. Um, the sort of rickrack is the cover of the novels and I just use scrapbooking scissors to cut out really thin strips and, and glue them on. The flowers are also from the cover and I just exacto knife the parts that I don't want to exist, you know, so they're more delicate. It's not just this big massive piece. And then I just fold it so that it'll curve upward and become three dimensional rather than being a flat piece of paper. They, in theory, could be worn because they all come off of the forms. I don't think it'd be comfortable. I don't think it would be practical. I really think you would have to worry about rips. For me, I don't really intend them to be worn. I intend them to be somewhat functionless, just kind of these symbols or stand-ins for beauty. But if you, if you were the size, I, I don't even, I think they're like, they have to be like a zero or a two. If you are a size zero or a size two, you could definitely wear them. As I said, I don't think it'd be fun. I, I mean, part of me wants to wear them because they're pretty, but I just think of like paper and like tape and hot glue, like rubbing. Mm -hmm. I would not be. Not be a good time. I feel like I've been pulling inspiration from my family more so. In the past maybe year and a half, I moved into my grandparents' home. So for a while, when I was getting my graduate degree, I was living in DeKalb, which is not super far away from my family, but I was an hour away. And I moved back in. I'm, I now live two miles away from my parents. I'm living in my grandparents' home. So it's kind of like whether I really want it to or not, my family is more of an important pers um, aspect of my life. So I think lately I have been pulling from that more. It's not always, though. I mean, I've done friends, dresses for friends and their stories. 
There's so little known about either of my grandmothers in a way. I mean, especially my paternal grandmother because there's not that legacy to carry down. She had five boys and boys don't care about stuff like that. So there's, there's really not like this passing of stories or this sharing. So there's just, you know, I, I really know so little about her life before she met my grandpa, before she had her children, before she kind of became an adult. And I just wonder what she was like. I know a little bit more about my maternal grandmother, but you know, we just don't have the same documentation that we have today. You know, how many years from now, if I have children, my grandchildren could potentially be watching this and seeing me talking about my work and have this visual of how I spoke and how, well, this is kind of convoluted because I'm on camera, but um, how I move and my mannerisms where I don't have, we don't have that of anybody from 50 years ago. So in a way, it's, it's almost, I guess, retroactive. Like I'm trying to pull from the past and it's forming my own myths almost because I don't have that truth. I don't have that certainty to say, oh, this was what my grandma was like and she would have worn this dress. I don't know if she would have worn this dress in her youth. I, I kind of have to pull from like the few stories I do have and what I would like to believe. Hi, my name is Ryan Heiser and I'm the Senior Vice President of Fisher National Bank in Muhammad. I recently attended the AMA program at Parkland College focusing on human resource development. For the past 10 years I was a community bank loan officer and the, the bank asked me to manage the Muhammad facility and in turn the uh, board of directors encouraged me to you know, take some human resource training. So after some research we found out that Parkland had the best program available. The uh, instructor was my favorite part. Um, Cindy was able to bring real life experience into the classroom and uh, it was really advantageous for me to, to, to learn from somebody that's with that much experience. Hi, I'm Richard Moninsky and I am the artist that made these paintings that you see behind you. Uh, I just want to say thank you again to Lisa for including me in this wonderful show and uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about this work. I've been, for about the last uh, 15 years or so, I've been very influenced by the world of textile and surface design and uh, I actually took a couple of courses at uh, the Fashion Institute of Technology a while back uh, in surface design and that's part of where this, this love of repeating pattern comes from. Uh, a lot of it had been in my work previously but um, for about the last 15 years I think it's, it's really come to the fore. It's been a, a strong ingredient in my work. In this present body of work I'm making works that uh, sort of represent the meeting place of cultural history and natural history. I've been painting on printed fabrics which are mostly camouflage fabrics and I'll uh, get to the why of that in a little bit but um, I've been trying to include a lot of uh, things that pertain to some of my interests and, and also relate to uh, where I grew up, which is Massachusetts. And many of my paintings reference the 17th century and uh, this being the time of European colonization in New England, uh, they deal in a kind of oblique way with the relationship between English culture and native culture. And in this piece, for instance, titled Quahog with Larval Fish from 2010, uh, I've included ingredients that for me have a lot of personal significance with regard to where I grew up. The, the 
various larval fish stages represented are of a species called a tatog, which is a uh, Narragansett Indian word, as is quahog, the name for this shellfish. And I also have included a portrait of John Winthrop, who was the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1630. And so uh, I'm, I'm representing native culture through uh, these words for these various animals. And I'm also representing English culture through the portrait. And uh, additionally, through the these words, which are place names in Massachusetts, half of them are English, half of them are native. And so it's uh, kind of my uh, tribute to the um, long and complicated history of, uh, of settlement in New England. So I mentioned I paint on camouflage fabrics, and uh, this came about quite by chance and af as a result of this happy accident where I, I just painted on a whim on a scrap of camouflage fabric, uh, I found that this was something that I could take and stretch in a number of different directions. Uh, much of my work deals with different levels of representation versus abstraction, particularly with regard to foliage. Um, thinking about the long history of representation of plants and flowers in, in textiles, in the history of textiles, there are all different levels of representation from extremely stylized and abstracted things on the one hand and very, very representational things on the other hand. And uh, incorporating camouflage into my work was um, one way to extend that idea a little bit since camouflage is essentially just a, a stylized foliage, it's a representation of foliage. And so the, um, the decision to use camouflage was um, not only a, a formal consideration, I liked all those little squiggles and bumps and things, but it also um, tied in with the other kinds of imagery that I was using at the time. And uh, you know, there, it, does, it does have many um, political associations as well. You know, there are, there are these references to the military and references to hunting, which I don't really deal with overtly in this body of work, but I have in the past. So it's, uh, it's something that has um, served me on, on many levels as a, a formal device and also as a, a conceptual tool. In addition to making paintings on printed fabrics, I also make smaller works on digital prints. And in this case, I'm taking the fabrics and scanning them, uh, making a print, and then drawing and painting on them with traditional media. Uh, or in some cases, going back and, and uh, scanning the work a second time after I've worked on it a little while. And uh, most recently, I'm, I'm working entirely with digital media on my iPad uh, with various drawing and painting programs, uh, chiefly one called Art Rage, which I think simulates painting uh, to a remarkable degree. But anyway, in, in these smaller works, I've really been enjoying the interplay of, of various media, uh, in this case, ink and gouache and acrylic, in this case, felt tip markers and acrylic. Uh, in this case here, um, this is acrylic with some gouache. And uh, in, other, in other pieces, I've used colored pencil. I've used bits of collage. Um, I just really uh, enjoy the opportunity to experiment with a number of different media and uh, also to kind of play off the, the different kinds of mark making systems that arise through, you know, through using one thing or another. But these smaller works um, incorporate the same kinds of imagery that the, that the large works do. The scale has changed obviously, but uh, the, the story is, is still pretty much the same. I'm, I'm interested in how the natural world has been systematized and stylized uh, in, the, in the world of textile design 
And I'm also interested in the historical angle and cultural angle. Yeah. The environmental aspects, the, the, uh, the natural history of the region, that, that certainly is tied in with the cultural aspects to a great degree as well. These, uh, these last two pieces are the most recent ones that I've done, and, and they're part of an ongoing series of, of these kind of mid-sized works. So uh, in addition to the, the very large pieces, or for me they're very large, they're about uh, five by seven feet, and these small works, uh, I also have work in this scale as well. And once again, I'm dealing with native plants and animals. In this case, uh, two animals whose names derive from Native American words, so the muskrat and the skunk. And I'm also looking at the European decorative arts tradition with things like uh, Baroque wood carving details or um, little bits from uh, historic tapestries. And so I'm, I'm trying to um, pull all that information together and, and make a statement on uh, the accumulated history of a particular place, uh, an accumulated history of my um, growth as an artist, uh, an, an accumulated history of uh, my physical journey through this world and uh, ultimately what I'm trying to do is incorporate as many things that I really love about art making as I can. So I, I really love the, the decorative impulse, I really love the gestural mark of, of abstract expressionism. Uh, I, I love making renderings of, of plants or animals or people uh, in, a, in a kind of realistic vein. And so I've, I've been searching for a number of years for uh, vehicles that will allow me to incorporate all those, all those impulses and uh, hopefully, you know, synthesize that into something that's, that's greater than just the sum of its parts. Often I'll work on more than one type of printed fabric and I can show you on this one here how I've joined two, two panels of two different prints. And you can see that uh, here's a little bit of the unpainted fabric that shows you the original black and white and gray print down at the bottom and this brown camo here on the top. And ultimately I, I try to integrate those two ideas yet uh, still keep some of the uh, original fabric showing through to, um, you know, to give me some kind of uh, foundation to, to play off when I add the uh, other imagery. I think for me uh, making those big shifts in scale with regard to the format of a piece is a way for me to clear my head. When I've been working on a very very large piece my physical relationship to the piece is very different than I'm working than when I'm working on a small piece and so getting that uh, making that change is just a really refreshing thing. Uh, your, your whole frame of reference to the piece changes because of your physical proximity. You have to be clo very close if you're working on a very small thing. And with a very large thing, you have to be able to stand away at a great deal. And uh, also just, just the physical dynamic of making a large piece is very, very different as well. And so that, that whole uh, set of activities changes and your, um, your perceptions change as, as the piece evolves. Uh, so for me, go, going back and forth from, from big to medium to small is a, a really help, healthy thing. I can't uh, just fall back on all, all my old tricks. I have to kind of a, a approach each size in a, with a kind of different set of expectations.